Thank you, Garish Society, and thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, security of, of hardware awards. Uh, this is uh, uh, quite quite difficult because security is uh, uh, is not very intuitive to understand, especially when it comes to information and secure hardware. And uh, it's doubly uh, like the next challenge is we will only have so you know not 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 too much time to speak about it. But also, uh, everyone comes from different levels of interest and understanding, and we will try to keep it uh, uh, borderline, borderline superficial and interesting, but also diving into a little bit of technology. Uh, some major disclaimers. First, I am not primarily, hey, more friends coming. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not primarily a security professional. We do collect, like I work, uh, I'm co-founder of a, uh, of a, uh, uh, a security solution in the space. And we work a lot together with our CTO and other professionals on, on security and other matters. Uh, so secondly, uh, I, I do have a conflict of interest because I am in the space and one of the products we're going to be discussing is uh, uh, a company I'm a co-founder of, but this is not a marketing talk, we will we'll try to be as objective as, as possible. And uh, thirdly, I, like as a, as a crypto user, I don't use all of the different solutions on a daily basis. Uh, we, we do concentrate on making our solution and like using it daily uh, and making it secure. And we do look into vulnerabilities of generic electronics and all of the other major solutions. Uh, but we, like, you, you, you guys might know even more than we do uh, if you use uh, other solutions uh, very often. So today we're going to focus on uh, uh, we, we, we can talk about anything, and there will be a Q&A later, but we're going to focus on uh, the four interesting solutions uh, when it comes to cryptocurrency hardware wallets, and they come from four different companies, Ledger Trezor, you probably, most of you heard about, OpenDime, many of you heard about, because they're quite, uh, their solution is quite different and interesting, and the newcomer to the scene is Tangem, and uh, uh, that's the company I'm, I'm co-founder of, and they have yet another solution to, uh, to security issues. Um, so this is a cute, quick overview of how they look in, in the wild, um, and uh, actually deconstructed. So Ledger and Trezor come packaged, but it's easy to deconstruct them and look what's inside, and there's a bunch of chips. And uh, OpenDime uh, comes uh, transparent without any pa without any plastic package on it, uh, except for the transparent one. And uh, there's also a bunch of chips of it on it. And Tangem is uh, is just a card. It's just like a smart card. And uh, there's just a single chip with an antenna on it. So um, when we talk about security, what we actually usually mean is uh, uh, two types of security. One is uh, sort of accidental, and uh, the, other is, the other is when we talk about hackers and attacks. And hackers and attacks, like purposeful targeted attacks, they take a lot of attention in the media and they sound cool because it's like some smart people uh, doing something cool. But actually, uh, until recently, most of the funds in crypto were lost to Accident, to accidents, like accidental loss. Uh, anyone who had crypto, <coughs> who had held crypto since 2010, 11, 12, like every single per per person I, I met, uh, they lost crypto to uh, a flash drive they discarded, or a passphrase they didn't keep, keep safe, or a hard drive that broke down, or something else. It's just. Uh, it's nobody's fault, uh, fault by, by their own, and it's still a major, major concern for uh, keeping your crypto secure, and uh, yeah, and, and, and we'll see that it matters. But the other one is, of course, attackers, right? So uh, I think in, in, uh, in order of significance and popularity, 
still online attacks and scams and phishing are by far uh, the most popular. And then comes malware that is gets installed onto your PC. And whenever you do something with crypto, it, it can uh, uh, hijack the operation and steal your crypto. Uh, and offline, uh, offline scams where they trick you into coming to a face-to-face -face meeting, meeting and uh, transferring the Bitcoin, but you never get uh, fiat. Uh, it, it's also quite popular for, especially for big amounts of money. And I think hardware tw attacks, they're still very rare. Uh, for mostly because uh, you, you, or it's still so much easier to to hack an exchange and get half a billion dollars compared to targeting you know a single ledger or a single trezor or a bunch of trezors or, or ledgers and hoping they, they would have some funds. It's still incredibly easy to hack into exchanges. It happens almost every month. On a, on a large scale, it happens a few times a year. But almost every month, a, a relatively big exchange loses some money, uh, or some ICO loses uh, access to uh, their smart contract or uh, some such. So uh, most of you holding crypto on some hardware or even on some uh, software wallet are safe, not because it's safe, but you are safe because nobody cares about us yet because it's so much easier to hack other things and in security it's uh, extremely important to understand uh, the current uh, the current landscape of security because uh, you, you can spend millions of dollars protecting against hardware attacks uh, but then discover that nobody even bothered to try to hack your hardware because it's so much easier to hack your software uh, it's still true even for exchanges that like Coinbase and, and other exchanges that are very, very serious about security. Uh, they keep everything on, uh, actually they don't, uh, last time they reported on how Coinbase does secure cold storage. Uh, they mentioned they don't use any hardware wallets. All they use are basically pieces of paper, paper, not even paper wallets, just pieces of paper with uh, seeds or hardware key or private keys and uh, encrypted flash drives. That's all they use. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, but even they can be vulnerable because uh, until recently it was trivial in the United States to hijack your phone number and uh, get into your Gmail, Coinbase, and steal all your money without any hardware uh, attack. Okay. Uh, sometimes, so it's, it's extremely, when designing a, a hardware solution, it's extremely uh, important to get both sides of the equation right. If, uh, because if you're designing a, a flash drive and uh, it, it's just an encrypted private key, you can say that is the most secure uh, hardware wallet in the world because you have to remember uh, a passphrase or some secret key in your mind. So instead of solving a security problem, you shift it from uh, a hardware level to uh, to user memory. So you say, okay, and th this is what actually Trezor and Ledger they do sometimes, and it makes sense. But it's important to understand that they shift part of the responsibility for security onto you, and you get prone. Like it's much more dangerous for it becomes much more dangerous for you to forget uh, a passphrase, a password compared to being attacked uh, on, on a physical, on, on a hardware level. So they say, okay, here's a Trezor, and, and actually recently, after many different types of hacks, uh, they started to be uh, more encouraging for their users to use passphrases when uh, using Trezors. Uh, but all that means is, even if your Trezor is uh, absolutely secure, if you forget the passphrase, nothing will help you. Uh, so that's like, it's important in, uh, for us, the manufacturers, but also for you as users, to clearly understand uh, the balance of, of the two. So uh, you, can, you can secure your hardware, but you can get very vulnerable to accidental loss through just, you know, memory loss. And um, uh, when we talk about hardware, there are, 
sort of two levels of thinking about hardware wallets or even hardware separate hardware storage. One is just plain dedicated hardware. And uh, I think mostly that's what Trezor is trying to be. And dedicated hardware means it's separate from your computer. Uh, and uh, it, it, yeah, it's separate from your computer. It also uh, is electronic. So what that gets you is your private key, you don't need to, so if, if it was a piece of paper, every time you used your wallet, you would need to transfer it to your computer first, which is quite dangerous uh, because PC are, PCs and even Macs are notorious for being easily infected relative to smartphones and, and separate hardware. So every, uh, every time you use your, your paper, uh, paper wallet or paper written a private key, you, you expose your key. But dedicated hardware, they manage keys and, and they can even sign transactions within uh, that, that separate hardware. And so nobody sees the, the private key. So you reduce, uh, you, you reduce your key exposure. What you also reduce, uh, <coughs> but, but not never cancel, is uh, the, uh, the ease with which malware can take all your value. Uh, so again, uh, like a large portion of uh, uh, of Windows computers are lacking latest up updates, and it's trivial to infect them. In fact, many of them are uh, already infected. And uh, if you do anything with crypto on that PC, that means you're uh, at risk or even almost guaranteed to lose your funds. But if it's a dedicated piece of hardware, uh, it doesn't run Windows or Mac or Mac OS or anything like that. It runs its own uh, software called firmware, and whatever happens on your PC, it, it doesn't affect it, especially if there's uh, buttons on screen where you can validate and verify the transactions you, you're making. And uh, uh, still, uh, dedicated hardware is prone to physical uh, attacks, to physical risk. like. If it's just uh, if it's just plain simple hardware without any security special security protections, then anyone who steals it physically from you uh, gets access to your funds. Or anyone who like we'll we'll look at some physical attacks types of physical attacks in a bit, uh, but it's like dedicated hardware. You have to keep it secure and you have to get it from secure sources. So if if it's a flash drive, if it's a simple flash drive. You have to ensure you got it from a very, very official store. Uh, otherwise, you you might have uh, you might get a, a fake hard drive, which will expose your keys later, uh, and and other attacks. But when it comes to secure hardware, uh, it uh, gets your protection from uh, a number of uh, a number of other classes of attacks, and uh, these are the uh, the broadest classes. Uh, and uh, let's see what, what they are. So a supply chain attack is uh, when an attacker uh, infiltrates the manufacturer uh, at any level. It can be the head office of, of the manufacturer where engineers sit down and program the software and uh, where decision gets made on security and where even private keys may be stored and then again the attackers might infiltrate the factory even without the head office knowing. Uh, so supply chain can be quite big. If we look at uh, at these types of these types of hardware, supply chain can be uh, can span three, five, ten companies. Look at this. There's like multiple types of chips. Uh, so on uh, the uh, the. Uh, the main chips on uh, Ledger and Trezor, they come from just one company, but it's very different uh, types of chips. They might get manufactured at different factories, facilities. Uh, OpenDime gets uh, their different chips from another uh, type of, uh, another company, uh, Atmel. But uh, what's important to understand that in, in addition to those chips, there are many more components uh, to the logic. There's LCD screen as well that comes from yet another manufacturer. There are buttons, yet another manufacturer, PCB, gets assembled somewhere, uh, plastic package. It's like five, six companies at least involved here. 
And attacking any one of them successfully, uh, which is like which has been done many many times before. That's why some of the protections we're going to talk about exist. Uh, attacking any one of them can compromise the whole device, and attacking any one of them systematically can uh, compromise uh, the the whole batch of device. Like if, if Ledger to date sold, I think 1.5 uh, around 1.5 million devices. Uh, if uh, if we we'll learn tomorrow that during the last two years let's say the screen manufacturer was infiltrated by someone with a potential to do something to it. It means all of those like millions of, uh, of devices are immediately at risk and we, can't, we cannot trust them anymore. Uh, so in, at some point simplicity, uh, like in supply chain, in protecting your supply chain, simplicity or end-to-end -end security is paramount. Uh, so let's like uh, before diving, let's look at other attacks. <coughs> Evil made attack uh, is uh, and by the way, supply chain attack does not does not end at manufacturing. It also uh, and where it's easiest maybe to attack is after uh, the hardware was manufactured and uh, gets into the distribution network. So you might have heard about multiple attacks where people get their ledgers or treasures off eBay and then lose all of their money. And that's uh, because of multiple types of attacks. But uh, let's just say that if, uh, if at any point in, in the distribution network, uh, the device was in the, hand, in the hands of uh, uh, a malicious uh, party, a malicious person, then you cannot trust it anymore. And that is extremely difficult to protect against because uh, you never know. So, you, you, can, you can come to uh, an official ledger reseller, uh, let's say, I think Genesis Blocks is selling ledgers in, in Wanchai or some other company, uh, and they themselves are uh, good people and they're trustworthy, but they ordered their ledger from somewhere, somewhere else. It was in the post, in transit, went through several hands before they got it in their store, and you, you never know what happened in transit, and it's very difficult to uh, to authenticate uh, the hardware when you got it without disassembling it and without being a security professional, which like nobody does it that way. Uh, there are more seats here. You can uh, actually. Uh. So, evil made attack is another. Uh, yeah, please. Evil made attack is another type of uh, attack uh, where uh, what it means is. You, you already own a device and it's uh, supposed to be protected, but what happens is you leave it out of your physical possession, out of your hands for a while. Uh, you, you probably, like, if, if you travel a lot, you probably know uh, that uh, at airports, it, like, they, uh, uh, they repeat a lot of time not, never to leave your luggage uh, out of your sight. Uh, so that like that, that's also against that type of evil made attack. So they, they get your device uh, from you and they do something to you, they tamper it, uh, they change something on it, uh, and they do it in a way that you wouldn't recognize the change. So they, they tamper with your device and they get, get it back to you and you don't even notice and you keep using it and then something happens and you lose your, all your funds. So. That type of uh, attack is, uh, is, with some types of hardware, it's uh, <coughs> the easiest type of attack. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that. And then there's physical theft. Physical theft, okay, someone steals your ledger trezor, and the only thing they care about is as quick as possible, they need to extract the private key from it and steal all your Bitcoin. And uh, of course, at some point, you notice the theft, and you you there's a risk where they rush to extract the private key, and you rush to find your recovery sheet with your seed, and whoever gets there first uh, takes all the money. So when the theft happens, you have to notice it very quickly, and you have to go get your recovery sheet if you still have it very quickly. Otherwise, they, they might uh, recover the, the private key and, and get all your money. And then there's uh, so-called interface malware, and uh, that's, uh, 
that, that's a very different type of mal malware, different from simple mal malware that infects your PC. Interface malware can uh, also infect your Windows PC, but instead of doing something to, to the PC as well, it sits there on your laptop and waits till you plug in your ledger or trezor and, or any other wallet uh, into the USB port, and then it tries to attack uh, specifically the device through that interface. Uh, it's, it's not a trivial attack, but uh, because Ledger and Trezor, at, at some point, they always have to be, uh, in many other wallets, always have to be connected to, to another device. Uh, that attack be, becomes, uh, uh, the, the, that attack surface, that attack possibility becomes inevitable. Uh, let's see. So, uh, to protect against those type of attacks, types of attacks, uh, different hardware wallets use different types of electronics. Uh, and uh, uh, there are two types of electronics. By default, all the electronics in the world are, um, let's say, insecure. And insecure means uh, if something is stored on it, if, if you have a flash drive and something is stored on it, then whoever steals it from you can easily read all the information on it. Um, another, uh, another factor of insecure electronics, when it processes some data, uh, it emits a lot of electromagnetic noise and some chips uh, even emit uh, audible noise like high frequency uh, sound noise. Uh, and that noise can carry information about what's happening inside. And there's been a lot of research showing that, for example, if you have a, a MacBook or any laptop, then the Intel chip inside, it's so noisy with the, with the operate, with, like in terms of electromagnetics and uh, even sound waves that, that come from power coils on the motherboard or other components, that it's possible to recover private keys from the next room. You don't even have to be in the, in the same room with the laptop. Even from the next room, if your Intel processor is doing some cryptography, which is what, what people do when they use their Bitcoin wallets uh, on their computers, even from the next room with uh, some sophisticated hardware, but not very, uh, not very expensive, it's maybe tens of thousands of dollars for hardware and the, the personnel to, to do it, but it's possible to extract even from the next room. Uh, so insecure electronic, it's very easy to read from them. It's very easy to glean some information from the electromagnetic waves uh, they are emitting. It's also very easy to tamper with. So uh, let's say you have some electronics and at any point in, the, in their life cycle, uh, it's, it's, very, it's relatively easy to connect to and to in fact, even, even the chip itself with some malware or to replace the firmware on it in a way that you wouldn't even notice or uh, do some other stuff which, in effect, would make the whole system uh, vulnerable. So a lot of types of attacks, uh, like all the usual electronics, is very vulnerable to it. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, when you write software that uses that electronics, you can, you can try some tricks. Uh, and we'll see it one particular attack that was very publicized on, on Trezor, and they found out that uh, they, can, uh, they can protect against some types of physical or invasive attacks uh, in software, but it's not very reliable. It uh, has been in development for decades, primarily for banking, military, uh, highly secure government purposes, and uh, all the other purposes where uh, secure electronics is very important. I think military has always been the driver because let's say you, you, you put uh, a chip in your missile or like anti-missile system to, to do something. And uh, then a year later when uh, something starts, you discover that all your chips are insecure and they have been hacked or they have, been, they have backdoors or some such. Uh, it's unacceptable. So the military and uh, other, other applications, like also medical and like uh, infrastructural 
applications such as atomic power plants, they all have to they all had to devise very very special ways to ensure that all the electronics they use at any point in their business are uh, extremely secure and trusted. So, what that means is uh, it, it, it's, it means a, a bunch of different types of concepts. Uh, but uh, there's a buzzword here, uh, which is called uh, EL. Uh, the, this chip is level six plus, that chip is level five plus. EL uh, was, uh, it, it, it's an abbreviation for enhanced assurance level. Uh, and assurance is a comprehensive approach to, uh, to, to a number of problems around electronics. So uh, these specific levels were devised by a multinational institute uh, called uh, Common Criteria. Uh, and Common Criteria basically uh, devises way, ways to ensure that electronics is secure through supply chain, through uh, its own physical uh, physical. Uh, parameters and through many other uh, so how does it work so let's say you're a chip vendor and you want to uh, to manufacture a chip that everyone can trust in the industry like you can sell it to the US military you can se sell it to to Tangem you can sell it to Ledger you can also sell it to uh, passport manufacturers in Europe like Delarue and other other companies how can you how can you make it trustable so what you do is, uh, it's a multi-multi-year process and it costs millions of dollars. It's, it's quite difficult, but it works. What you do is, you, you uh, basically collect all the engineers on your team, or security engineers, and they write down all the potential attacks that can happen, you know, again, in the supply chain, on your factories, on your office offices, build, office buildings, and later on, on, on the chip itself, like people trying to extract information from it, and all, all, uh, all of those kinds of attacks. You sit down for a year, you write down all those kinds of attacks, it's massive research. And then you present this research to specialized institutions, and they, they are, uh, like the, for this, these types of certifications, they are mostly in Europe, Western Europe, uh, <coughs> North America, and Japan. So I, I think only three areas, there's like a handful of them. And uh, they look at all of those, all of that specification for another year, and they come back to you to say, "Okay, that looks reasonable," or "Okay, let's uh, expand potential attacks with another list." And uh, that that's already like one or two years, and then they spend another three, four years going through every part of your infrastructure, like they visit, like they send delegations to factories. In the factories, it's very important. They check that all the uh, security, like physical security in the factory, is very, very serious. Like they have uh, KYC on every employee at the factory. Uh, they uh, they have uh, security badges, like special security zones. Uh, it's very, very um, like some of those factories that are manufacturing these types of chips. They look like NSA or CIA compounds. They have huge doors. Uh, they, uh, uh, I don't think even have pictures because it's impossible to take pictures there. If a factory is uh, EMV certified, like Eurocard, Mastercard, Visa, it's uh, another type of certification, then no one ever is allowed to take a camera device or a smartphone inside. You have to leave it like uh, in the lobby. So uh, they are very, very serious. And same happens to the office buildings that are working on those chips. So in the end, after like three, four, five, seven years, you, you get a final certification for a specific kind of chip uh, and its applications that is uh, like one of the most respected certification is this AE enhanced assurance level uh, and there are levels one to seven. Seven can only be achieved by some rare types of uh, uh, banking chips for, uh, for Visa MasterCard. Uh, level six plus is as uh, as high as it goes for generic electronics that is used in, in blockchain operations, five plus is like slightly slightly less secure. So um, okay, so secure electronics designed uh, for decades to be extremely secure across the whole supply chain, 
and uh, across the whole life cycle after it's manufactured. And this is a very difficult process, and we sometimes hear from, uh, e e like, uh, okay, security is so hard that uh, it's very hard to, it's very easy to uh, throw things in it. So sometimes uh, Treza, and there's merit in what they say, but Treza, multiple times the chief technical officer said that the whole secure electronics is uh, uh, so difficult and so uh, opaque because like nobody knows what really, like it, it's, it's only limited to that security professionals that study uh, the, the vulnerabilities and ensure it's secure. And they say it's so opaque, nobody understands it, that we can we cannot use it. We want to be transparent to our users, and if our users don't understand how our electronics work and can't verify it, we cannot use it. And there's some merit in that argument, of course. Yeah, like there's a conspiracy theory that all the chips are have backdoors unless you can verify it. Uh, uh, but even then, the STM. 32-bit chip, it has a part to it that is not open uh, and could contain backdoors in, in theory. But in practice, uh, the, the certifications that these chips, uh, chips have, they are trusted by, like implicitly trusted by 33 countries, like all over the world, Europe, America, uh, Asia, and uh, uh, you know, some of the, those countries, they don't agree with the policy of NSA, backdoor and everything. So they, they ensure, they, they put maximum effort on ensuring uh, there's no compromise there. So uh, there is merit in those actions and there's no other, like if you're building an, an, a nuclear power plant, you cannot go with, with insecure electronics. It will just get very easily compromised. So you, you have to use uh, something secure. Okay, so different devices, as we saw again, have different number of chips. And Trezor has just one main chip, and it does everything on it. And uh, uh, we can say it's like completely, the chip itself is completely insecure. Trezor go goes to some lengths with its software to make it more secure, but the chip itself, the electronics, it's completely insecure. What Ledger does is more interesting. It has two chips. One is the same, exactly the same chip that runs Trezor, but they also have a second chip, ST31. It's a secure ele uh, element, and uh, it's uh, uh, the type of chip that's, that's secure electronics. Uh, and by the way, the, as another example, like everything, everyone who has uh, uh, the iPhone with Apple Pay, uh, Apple Pay is a separate chip inside the iPhone. And they do it that way because that chip contains your credit card data from Visa or MasterCard or some other company. And even if some, somebody steals your iPhone, in theory, they can extract data from your flash memory. They can extract your, in theory, they can extract your photos. Like it's very, very hard, but like it's been shown that they can. Uh, and your contacts and all that. But because your credit card data is uh, secured in a separate special purpose chip, uh, it's almost impossible to extract it. So that's another very popular use for secure electronics. So Ledger uses a chip like that to generate and store your private key uh, and uh, make signatures for the Bitcoin transactions. So what it means is uh, the, uh, uh, the private key is never exposed to this uh, insecure electronics. So whatever you do to the insecure electronics, it's very, very difficult to get the private key. Uh, if you steal or tamper the device. But uh, why does it need the, the second chip? And the reason for that is Ledger is a complicated device. In, in addition to the basic logic of generating and storing the private key, it also has a huge screen, it also has buttons, it also has the USB interface, and all of that cannot be served by this type of chip. This chip is a few years old. It's very secure, or relatively secure, for that, uh, for, for that time frame, but it's not powerful enough to handle screen and buttons and USB. So they have to connect it to a second chip. And what that means is potentially, these, uh, if somebody tampers this, this part of chip, 
they don't they still don't have access to the private key but they can compromise whatever you see on the screen and whatever you input with your buttons they can basically tamper with that and that's a big risk we'll see and then there's open dime open dime is quite simple it doesn't have a screen or buttons uh, it has a tiny indicator on it at least some models do and uh, so uh, it also has this double approach. It uses uh, different different chips, but this is a secure element. Uh, it lacks uh, a comprehensive certification, but uh, so far there are no known attacks on, on this type of chip. So we can we cannot say if it's like uh, insecure. Uh, it just doesn't have a high level certification, but it is designed to be a secure element. So it also generates on, on open time it generates and stores the, the private key and uh, never discloses it to the second chip unless you do something to, to ledger or to, to open time. So uh, open time uh, open time has this uh, special uh, uh, special way to, to operate. It has um, it is difficult to see in this picture, but it has a uh, like different models do it differently, but it has a, a hole which you can uh, physically damage with a pin, and as soon as you do that, uh, as you do that, the secure chip uh, gives gives up the the private key to the main chip, uh, and uh, that that is needed to actually make a transaction with OpenDime. So OpenDime uh, it, like keeps your private key secure uh, as long as you don't tamper with that special feature. But uh, as soon as you da damage that special uh, special hole, it can only be made once. It discloses the private key. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So it, it, it uh, and of course with Ledger, when you generate uh, when you generate uh, the the private key here, what's critical to know is that uh, once in this lifetime. It, uh, uh, it can disclose, it has to disclose the, the private key to the screen for you to write down uh, the, the seed for recovery. And that's a big security risk as well because when it goes through the insecure chip, then uh, it means it can, be, uh, it can be gleaned or stolen from that. So same happens here, but we say that uh, potentially it's more secure because uh, here, if, if, you, if uh, in Ledger you compromise uh, this chip, you, you can compromise the, the buttons and the screen throughout the life cycle of, of, the, uh, of the device, whereas on OpenDime it doesn't have any buttons or screen. Uh, you can, even if you compromise uh, this part of, uh, of the chip, you will, uh, you will not get people to make a faulty transaction or disclose the private key because that only happens when you tamper with, with a special feature and disclose the private key, at which point it's obvious that, uh, that uh, like from, from any user of OpenDime, that the private key has been disclosed. And they can, if everything is well, they can just take the private key and make a transaction. Uh, otherwise, they, they can see that the money is gone already. So with Tangem, uh, due to, like, thanks to the simplicity of it, because it's just a single chip, uh, is the only device on, in the market that's, uh, that only has fully secure electronics. And it doesn't make it ideal. We'll see that there's a trade-off there. But uh, right now it's, uh, it's the only hardware wallet that has only one chip on it, and that chip is, is a highly certified secure element. Uh, and there's nothing to tamper with. All the communication with the chip is end-to-end -end encrypted. So it's like the story is much simpler uh, and the attacks on uh, on this device have to be made uh, like it's almost impossible to attack the chip the attacks have to be made on another uh, on another side of its functionality um, so uh, what does this uh, so all of these devices have protections against like they're not useless they're actually very very useful and compared to keeping your uh, Bitcoin, all your Bitcoin on a Chinese exchange or on a paper wallet or uh, on a, uh, on a hot wallet on your computer or, or your phone. Compared to all of those situations, 
uh, all of these wallets provide different levels of protection. So let's see, Trezor primarily because it's just dedicated hardware. Uh, I think the primary, uh, primary use case for it is to make sure you don't care about your uh, about malware on your uh, on your PC, even if your computer is infected with a uh, lot of viruses. So you connect your Trezor. If it's just simple malware, uh, it can hijack uh, everything you do. But uh, when you're trying to send a transaction, uh, both Ledger and Trezor will will display some confirmation. They will say look, you're trying to make a transaction to this address, are you sure? And uh, that part is, is critical. So if you, uh, if you have a way to ensure that that indeed is correct wallet, then even if your PC is infected, nothing will happen. Uh, so the worst uh, that will happen is your uh, transaction will not go to the network because the, the PC will prevent it. But the PC cannot do anything to the dig digital signatures that are generated by this dedicated hardware. So um, there's, still, there's still danger because uh, let's, say, uh, uh, let's say somebody uh, says, OK, send me Ether or Bitcoin to this address, and uh, you will get some tokens, or you will get whatnot. Uh, and uh, if you fail to double check the address, uh, if you don't call them or use a secure chat from, from your other device, uh, then the, the malware on your PC can just exchange the wallet address that they sent to you with uh, another one. And even, even though Trezor is fully secure, you will still send uh, money to, to the wrong address, but uh, that's, uh, that's an attack no hardware can protect you against. Like all of these, uh, all of these devices, uh, if you if you have the wrong address, uh, you will still send it to the wrong address. So like the, these devices cannot do anything about that. But if, if your computer is infected, Trezor is effective against that, and that's good enough. That's very useful. Ledger goes uh, uh, maybe a step forward. It also protects you from from uh, computer malware or viruses, but it can also protect you uh, if somebody steals. Uh, ledger from you, then uh, if, if it's not a very sophisticated thief, uh, they will have a very hard time extracting your private keys from Ledger. So from Trezor, because the electronics is, uh, is insecure, uh, relative to Ledger, it's much easier to get your private key material from here. And again, the latest that Trezor uh, tells you to do is to protect uh, pr protect your uh, private key with uh, with a, uh, with a uh, BIP 39 extension, which is basically an extra uh, word in your seed, without which you cannot use your your private key. So they uh, couldn't fully secure the hardware, and they shifted part of the security onto your brain. So in your brain, you have to secure your Trezor with with an extra passphrase. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of Ledger, because it's secure electronics, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can do passphrase protection, you can do BAP39 extension protection, you can also use just PIN, PIN number. Uh, because it's secure electronics, it's quite difficult without knowing the PIN and, uh, uh, yeah, without knowing the PIN to extract the private key. Uh, it's, it is still potentially possible to uh, you know to get your pin if if you instead of theft you you do an evil maid attack and compromise that insecure chip and return it to the user and then let them press the buttons and then the compromised chip can disclose uh, the, the secrets back to you open time uh, is a very different uh, type of hardware so both ledger and trezor you can only use them if two conditions, you can only rely on them if two conditions are met. One, the way you got them in the first place was secure. So the only way to, uh, like we joke that the only way to really do that securely is to go to Paris, like, or like, yeah, uh, they, they both, both of them are based in Europe. So go to Europe, 
grab the CEO and CTO, and like maybe some security professional, then fly over to Shenzhen or like wherever the supply chain is, go to the factory, uh, look very closely at how all the equipment in the factory is initialized and how well, manufacturing is done, and then uh, verify the device is solid and, and good at the end of that manufacturing process, grab it there, and from that point on, never let it out of your sight uh, ever in your life. So that's, that's the only 100% sure way uh, that you, you, can, you can get it securely. But at this point, because all the hackers are still targeting exchanges extent of your wallet, instead of your wallets, don't worry. Like most of the ledgers and trezors, uh, if you follow the instructions on their websites to verify that it's authentic, you can almost 100% be sure that uh, they are authentic. But uh, the number two condition is also very important. It's private use only. So you, you have to get it from a trusted source, which is right now a not very big problem. But number two, you can never let it out of your sight. If you give it to someone even for a minute and you don't have it in your sight, then you're at risk. If you give it to someone for a day, then it's trivial for them to, to tamper with it. But if you give it for a minute, only very sophisticated attackers can tamper with it and return it back to you without you noticing <coughs> anything, and uh, that's a problem. So private use only. Open time is completely different because it was designed from, from the uh, get-go, from the start, for public circulation. So open time uh, markets itself as the first uh, Bitcoin bearer uh, bond, which means that you can make physical payments with it. And uh, physical payments mean that somebody can accept open dime from you, uh, verify that it's authentic and that it has a balance, and they don't have to trust you personally. They can trust the hardware. Uh, and the reason they, they, uh, uh, they can uh, do that is because there's nothing to effectively tamper with. So again, Ledger and Trezor, they have uh, screens and buttons that uh, can be compromised with, uh, and, and they're meant for like multiple and multiple transactions uh, that you're making almost every day. Whereas OpenTime doesn't have any screens and buttons, there's nothing to compromise like that. Uh, and it, only, it is only meant to make one transaction ever. So it's like one transaction public circulation. Uh, you can circulate it as much as you want, uh, uh, but you can only extract the funds once when you destroy the, the special stamp and then uh, you get the private key, that's it. You cannot use it uh, physically anymore. You have to throw it out. Whereas Tangium is, an, is a significant evolution on that concept. And uh, it's... Uh, uh, what you can say, you can call infinite transaction public circulation. It's a hardware wallet which can be used uh, for infinite number of transactions, in, incoming or outgoing, and it's also completely safe in public circulation. So uh, you, you, can, you can always trust it even if you get it from a very untrusted person um, and you, uh, you don't know how many people owned it before. Uh, you can just check the hardware with, uh, uh, w with a trusted phone, w with your smartphone that you hope is not infected. And uh, if, it, if, you're, if the software says uh, the, the hardware is intact and authentic, you can be 100% sure that, uh, that it's secure. And, uh, uh, and, and that's much more difficult to do maybe than all of that, and that's much, uh, a much worse case for, uh, for security uh, because uh, what, what we had to design uh, in hardware is that whoever has the hardware for however long cannot do anything to it. And of course, uh, the, the business plan for all of this is have to have millions of, and millions of devices in the wild and that means millions of people have access to them and at no point uh, in time can anyone tamper with, with the chips and hardware or extract the private keys that are <coughs> on them. Um, so 
uh, the the types of effect, uh, attacks or uh, and uh, how different wallets are more or less protected against it. So let's let's quickly go uh, over them again. Uh, so we have different types of attacks. So supply chain is where you uh, where you attack the device at uh, any point in the manufacturing life cycle or distribution life cycle. And uh, with uh, Ledger, it's uh, uh, sort of straightforward, but because of the secure element inside, it's uh, more difficult than uh, than let's say Trezor. Uh, you you can in any at any point compromise the insecure element, the, uh, the gen generic purpose multi uh, 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 MCU uh, that, that controls the, the buttons and, and the screen. Uh, but like at some point, the, the secure, L, well, you can't extract uh, the private material, key material that easily from the secure element. And, uh, um, uh, and yeah, the, the secure element also is authenticated the rest of hardware, so it might even notice that you did something to, to the insecure part. Whereas, whereas Trezor is relatively fully open, uh, we saw even very uh, unsophisticated attackers achieve success with it. Open Dime is quite hard because, uh, again, this, the attack surface is quite small, and with Tangium, uh, uh, there's only sing a single chip, there's nothing to compromise, and the chip is certified with, with this certification, which is almost impossible to, uh, to compromise. So, with uh, evil made is when you steal the device for some time, uh, and, uh, and then return it without, uh, without anyone noticing. And the situation is basically the same, and maybe for Trezor, uh, it's less trivial to do that, uh, because well, basically, it's, it has a uh, it has a plastic package that uh, uh, that is uh, almost impossible to uh, to open up without destroying the device. You have to be you know you have to you have to have a, a separate um, a duplicate plastic package to put it back into after you compromise it, and it has to be done very quickly. So it's like it's less trivial than supply chain attack, where you have a lot more time. Uh, same with physical set theft, uh, where Ledger, because of the secure element and how it keeps the, the whole secret there, it's quite hard to compromise. Uh, Trezor is, is uh, tried to make uh, some adjustments in its software to make it harder, but <coughs> relatively it's still trivial, even for very unsophisticated uh, attackers to, to uh, extract the material. Again, they like you, you can use... Uh, you can use a passphrase protection for Trezor, and then of course it's impossible to attack or very difficult to attack uh, with theft. But that's not because the hardware is secure, but that that's because part of the security was shifted to your brain instead of the hardware. And uh, open time, we believe it's uh, it's still very hard to uh, to extract anything from it if if stolen uh, without uh, uh, or to to. Yeah, to, well, I, actually it's, it's designed to be uh, fully physically acceptable, so as soon as you, as you steal an open dime, you, you, can, you can get the, the private key. So, um, um, or like, maybe, like, I, I was thinking about, like, uh, let, let's say with, uh, with Tangem and uh, open dime, uh, when you steal them physically, uh, they are both bearer items, so they, uh, they carry value on themselves physically, so when you steal them, you steal the value, uh, but that's not a hardware attack. When you steal them, you don't need to attack hardware, you get access to the value inside uh, without, uh, by, by design, because it's designed to be physical value. Uh, but the, the hardware remains completely secure, even when you steal them. Uh, then. Uh, comes the the computer malware, or what can be called terminal. Terminal is anything that interfaces with your wallet. It can be a computer, it can be your smartphone. Uh, that, that's mostly it. If uh, if your terminal is completely compromised by a virus, then Ledger and Trezor still pr protect you quite well. Open Dime 
fails immediately because uh, when you when you're trying to make a tra transaction with OpenTime, uh, maybe I should adjust this. When uh, OpenTime fails only when you're trying to make a transaction with it. If you're just verifying it, it it's still like completely uh, protected. But if you're trying to make a transaction, OpenTime immediately exposes the private key to the computer. That's the only way to, to make a transaction with OpenTime. Whereas Ledger and Trezor, they make, they sign a transaction on device without exposing the private key to, to, to your computer. Uh, OpenTime does expose your key to your computer by default. So if your computer is infected, then OpenTime is not for you. You'll lose all your, all your money immediately. With Tangem, it's, uh, it only works with uh, smartphones. Uh, so we sort of rely on the security of Apple and Google infrastructure, which are, uh, and also Huawei, Xiaomi, uh, and a bunch of other companies, which generally do a very good job at protecting their devices from viruses. Uh, but let's say if your device is rooted, uh, then you might be at risk at, uh, at a virus, viral infection on your phone. And then whenever you're trying to make a transaction with your, uh, with your Tangem card, you, you will get compromised because the, uh, the phone will just make a transaction to some other address. Same here, it, it will just, with OpenTime, it will just use the private key to send a transaction to some other address. Uh, interface attacks are the attacks which uh, try to uh, compromise the device through the physical interface, USB, NFC. Uh, uh, so with Ledger, we believe it's quite hard because, again, the private key material is in the secure element, and whatever you do through USB, uh, it only gets to compromise the, the main chip, but not the secure chip. With Trezor, we believe, theoretically, it's more than possible. So there, there has be, have been some indications. OpenDime is a secure element. Uh, it, uh, like, there's nothing to compromise again. So it's quite secure against interface attacks, we believe. Whereas Tangium, uh, it, it's probably impossible to attack because uh, there's nothing between the chip uh, and, uh, and the NFC phone. Uh, there's... Uh, uh, the chip itself has the NFC controller, and that is covered by the secure, uh, secure uh, certification. Even OpenDime has USB interface, which is outside the secure element, but uh, we're on, on Tangium, it's all in one chip. And then uh, forgotten key. Uh, that's not an attack. That's just a fact of life. And with uh, Ledger and Trezor, it's definitely if you if you use some P, uh, if you use the passphrase or BAP39 extension key then it's definitely possible for you to lose all your funds just because of bad memory. With OpenDime, it's not applicable, uh, and with, with Tangem as well, because uh, by default, they don't require, uh, like, they, they only require physical access to get value, to, to get access to the value inside. So uh, with that, we can look at a few interesting pictures. Uh, this is the architecture of uh, uh, this is the architecture of Ledger. Uh, that's the official picture from the docs. And uh, well, what you can see is there are two chips. Actually, this chip is smaller than this one, but we had to show more. So this is the secure element, ST31, and this is the general purpose uh, chip uh, th that is insecure. And as you can see, the, uh, like most of the cryptographic processes are happening in, in the secure compartment. So the key generation, signatures, all of that, applications uh, on their proprietary uh, uh, operating system that uh, supports all, all the different tokens and all the different cryptocurrencies are all super secure. The problems start here. The, Screen, the buttons, and the USB controller are all, all served by a completely insecure chip that is theoretically easy to tamper with. So if we compromise this, this is still secure, but you, you cannot trust anything that you input with your buttons or that you can read on, on the screen. So that's a potential problem. Uh, with Trezor, they, these are images from uh, a well-known attack uh, done a few months ago. Uh, 
Uh, like, well, there are two methods to do it. One of them in includes uh, freezing the device, and these graphics just show that uh, if the temperature of the device is very low, then the memory, uh, the the memory uh, and the data in the memory, it uh, stays for a few seconds or a few minutes, even after the device is uh, uh, unpowered, and. Uh, uh, th that wasn't the only way to attack it. Um, so basically, Trezor, uh, when it works, uh, when it make, it's making a transaction, it, uh, uh, it puts the private key unencrypted into its main memory, into its RAM, and that makes it very, very easy for an attacker to, to get access to, to that, all that data. Uh, all, all the electronics on Trezor are relatively insecure, not the, just the chip, but they also left uh, reset pin uh, and, uh, and other pins completely functional, which means you can get access to, uh, to debugging functions of the chip quite easily and reflash it with another firmware. So what they did to protect from that attack is uh, they basically ensured that uh, all the private key material when it gets into the RAM, it will only be placed in the first 32 kilobytes. It's like a tiny, tiny uh, area of RAM. And that area, uh, by co coincidence, when, uh, when Trezor is restarted, when, when somebody tries to use the reset pin to get access to debug functions, just by coincidence, the bootloader of Trezor uh, overrides that first 32 kilobytes of, of RAM. So that, that's, a, that's a tiny trick. They, they used to protect against that sort of attack. But in general, it's been shown many, many times that uh, using a, an electron microscope uh, or some other hardware, uh, if you just uh, do some operation with the private key on Ledger, on Trezor, and uh, unplug it from the power, it's, uh, it's, still, uh, it's still easy to, to glean data from that RAM. Uh, it's still not, not very hard because it's insecure and unencrypted. So that's still uh, quite, uh, potentially quite insecure. Uh, and uh, th these are the pictures from an analysis uh, of uh, th this, this article on side channel, a side channel attack on a secure element in a smart card. This is not a hardware, uh, a hardware wallet for cryptocurrency, but it uses a very similar chip to uh, uh, to to what hardware to to what secure element are used on OpenTime, Ledger, or Tangier, and a side channel attack uh, was very creative. The the what it basically uh, means and what it basically was is your smart card is uh, somehow interacting with the software and using the uh, the private key uh, to to sign transactions. And because it's a secure element, it's trying to, uh, and, and that's getting back to that, those electromagnetic noise we talked about. Uh, because it's a secure element, it tries to make that noise very, very, um, very, very not descriptive. So even if you listen very carefully to that electromagnetic noise, you cannot get any data from it. But uh, apparently the researchers employed a very creative ways to, uh, to to clean up that noise as they do in in you know action movies, and uh, through like some months of research, they were finally able by measuring very carefully measuring that noise with very sophisticated uh, hardware and uh, cleaning it up with custom software. So it, it cost them a few months of labor and some some hardware, but uh, eventually they were able to. Uh, extract um, uh, extract uh, private key data from that electromagnetic noise. So since then, uh, the chips like that they were upgraded several times. Um, even uh, like uh, one of the protections is uh, chips uh, generally look like that. If you look at them under a microscope, they have elements, and sophisticated attackers can uh, immediately say, okay. This area is probably the ROM part, this area is probably RAM, this area is probably the crypto processor, and so on. And by analyzing like, the, uh, the architecture of the chip, it becomes much more easier to glean data from it. 
But what new chips look like, and there's not even a, a good picture of it, is they scramble the whole surface of the chip that it looks like nothing. It's just gray goo uh, because uh, they were designed that in a way that mixes up all of their components, that makes it completely useless and impossible for security researchers to, to get this scheme, like where different parts are, or, of it are. Okay. Uh, Okay, I believe that's, uh, that's the end of, uh, of good pictures. And uh, uh, yeah, so we have uh, just uh, maybe to show you. Uh, uh, so probably a lot of you saw Ledger and Trezors already. Uh, here we have a couple. Uh, I believe they carry less than 1 million USD each, uh, but uh, uh, it doesn't mean that nobody will ever try to attack them. These look like some early ones, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, from, uh, yeah, still from the 90s, uh, when <laughs> very few people knew about <laughs> cryptocurrencies. Now, this may be from 2014 or... If it, uh, totally around that time. Yeah, uh, when uh, uh, Ledger was still a very small company, now it's a bigger company. Uh, so they look just like flash chips, uh, but they they have quite creative electronics inside. And uh, oh, these ones are they they come without any screens, right? Mm. Right. So uh, okay, a different a different type of ledger from the current the popular model Nano S. Uh, and uh, to cut back straight to the uh, to take a time machine straight back to to the future. Uh, uh, this is uh, th these are Tangem. Uh, we, we call them smart banknotes, but essentially they are hardware wallets. And in, inside, it's just a, a single tiny chip. It's uh, credit card size, a little bit thinner and smaller. Uh, a chip and an antenna. And uh, yeah, let's get back to the uh, wallet picture. Uh, yeah, uh, this is not uh, to scale. So. Uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, so the, the card is maybe the biggest one right now, uh, also the thinnest one. And uh, yeah, so that's about it. Uh, we can, uh, um, well, let's summarize on a good note. Uh, right now, uh, any type of hardware wallet you're using uh, makes you so safer. Like whether it's Ledger, Trezor, uh, OpenDime, Tanja, or any of the, there's a bunch of other ones that are quite secure. Uh, with a high chance, they make your you more secure. What we believe is uh, once exchanges get their act together, because right now it's like wild west in the exchange market uh, for cryptocurrencies. Once they get their act together and start actually securing their values, uh, their holdings it will be more and more difficult to attack them. And maybe they get ICOs to use them also, to use their security products. So it will get, uh, it will get more difficult to attack, uh, to attack ICOs as well. And uh, so right now it's much easier to attack exchanges and ICOs than anything else. So once those people get their security uh, up to the level, then hackers and attackers will switch to us. They will switch to attack and uh, millions of users with sophisticated malware, sophisticated attack on supply chains of Ledger, Trezor. Uh, that's probably realistically one, two years in the future. Um, right now it's just not economical to try to get into the Ledger factory and do something to it. Uh, only maybe small scale attacks. Like you have to be careful if you get your Ledger from eBay. It's not a good idea. Get it from a good store. But otherwise you, you're probably safe. But you have to start learning now. Like uh, one thing, every one of us who had crypto a few years back lost some to some, for, mostly to some stupidity, like forgotten passphrase. But everyone in this room who has some crypto, with almost 100% chance, will lose it in, in the next like two, three years. So some part of it, not all of it, hopefully. Uh, yeah, so you, you, have to, you have to start getting into these concepts Right now, what we we're trying to do with Tangem is to make it uh, to shift the security into the physical part, uh, 
And uh, I, I didn't get the very superficial uh, and in introductory sort of uh, introduction to what Tangium is, but we, we're trying to shift security from digital to, to physical. But right now, it's a, any physical solution is good, and uh, it's the best time to start learning about it, to start reading as much as you can. Security is difficult, and if you don't read up on it, then you know, a year or two in, in, in the future, you might lose some, some value. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks for listening again, and let's cut to, uh, to discussion. Uh.